get down to some uh, nitty gritty. Okay. What, I, okay. So what were the uh, China and Europe? Yeah. Well, I was looking at the, uh, you know, just the trade war and uh, comments from last night, which got the break going and, um, and then some of these guys were listening to uh, a, uh, an interview the other day. Angelo had some, a different view on possibly what was going on in Europe, but he, he's doing his Friday morning rituals. He's not in. But I'll let you go and then take it from there. Okay. All right. Europe, we know certain things, okay? We know that this is going to be a battle. The lines truly are being drawn. Where the guard goes, don't know. There was an interesting article in the FT today about the uh, ECB should step up its buying of uh, lower grade corporate credits and they're, should, they're actually able to do it. It was, it was a, an article by uh, some guy who's a research analyst and written in typical research case. I don't know that it's to be true that they can do that. It's a, based on a national bank. The rules in Europe are so convoluted and it's always difficult. You see, it's because when you fail to make a decision after all these years, which they've done, failed to make a decision, you never resolve anything. They don't have the, they don't have the intestinal fortitude to resolve these issues. So they just, in the, in, this, in the language of CNBC, they'll kick the can down the road, which only results in more and more problems. So there's no resolution. And then when you do get to a crisis such as this, and you've already s spent so much of your ammunition in, in just treading water, you're really at a, uh, a major uh, inflection point. So that, I mean, that's, that's where Europe's at. Now, you know, everybody said, well, you know, if you, anybody, who, if you've been following the, the conversation on the blog, you know, a lot of guys think that Germany can just pull the plug. I don't think that Germany can pull the plug. I think they're in too deep right now because of what's going on for the previous uh, five, six years under Draghi, which was done under the guidance or this, uh, of Angela Merkel, because Draghi could never have done at the ECB what he did. And I mean, what I mean by that is massively building up that balance sheet without the okay for Merkel. And she, and she kept running interference for him. And, uh, and, I, and I maintained back in 2011, and I maintained it in 2019. That's why they needed a German at the head of the ECB, because the Germans would have been much more, uh, I think, cooperative. I think the German citizenry would have been very comfortable with a German at the, at the helm. And it should have been Axel Weber. I mean, I've got, I wrote blog after blog after blog after blog, because I'm a big fan of Axel Weber, even though he's a hard money person, and I know it would have been difficult, but it would have been far better. Mer Merkel's gotten bested, but again, the narrative is she's great, she's done everything. I think it's baloney, and I think it's what, why we're at this very critical juncture. And while everybody's concentrating on the courts, I would advise everybody to pay attention to German politics. I don't think we have any elections coming up, you know, the regional elections. But as I, as I maintained the other day in the blog, you, you have to hear from Merkel herself and then from Wolfgang Schweibel. Now, Schweibel is the president of the Bundestag. But before his previous role before that was the, the finance minister of Germany. And Schweibel is a very hard money advocate. So, but we haven't heard from them. And the whole court issue now is the predominance of um, the Bundestag as the arbitrator of German fiscal policy. And really this whole concept of proportionality as the, as the uh, German high court deemed it is really about, is the ECB through its actions really uh, impinging upon the fiscal policy of Germany. 
that, that's really when you when you with all I've read through it, uh, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, there's of course so many other issues. The the decision was 100 pages long in German, 90 pages long in English. But this is going to be a very difficult uh, situation. And again, I don't care about everybody's opinions. I care about trading this. And what are the opportunities? Because listen, otherwise, you know, go turn on CNBC, go turn on, you know, uh, CNN, go turn on MSNBC, go get go get the standard narratives and listen to it. And then you can sit and have a cocktail uh, and, and discuss it. But I, for me, that's not important because the, the real significance is, is the financial impact. And that's why Germany cannot pull out here. The impact to the global banking system will be enormous. Coupled with everything else that's going on, it will be even that much. It would be enormous in if the U.S. unemployment was still 3.5%, the impact would be enormous on the global banking structure. And this is what Lagarde knows. So if I'm Christine Lagarde, as long as I've got this, now it's about an 85-day, 84-day window, uh, I'm building up that balance sheet because that's the critical juncture here. Because basically by building up that balance sheet, I'm creating a synthetic euro bond as I've maintained with Santelli's discussion for four years. Uh, that through the back door, because they're going to consolidate, because either you consolidate it all or it all falls apart. If it all falls apart, the losses on the global financial system and everybody's playing with this and going, well, if the Germans, no. If, if the Germans go back to the Deutschmark, okay, because, you know, you, you can only make certain assumptions here. If the Germans said, no, we're not going to do this anymore, you're violating it, you're violating the, the, uh, the popular will, the general will of the German people, the German will, and, and this is what, you know, of course, it, it boils down to. Who is sovereign here? Is the European Union sovereign over Germany or is Germany sovereign over the European Union? Or do we have a, do we have a, a federal republic of Europe or do we have a confederation of states? It's a very serious issue only because of the financial implications. Otherwise, nobody would really care. You know what? Then we'd have Brexit vote after Brexit vote after Brexit vote. But you have to pay attention to the German politics here. But the impact from what we're talking about, it's all financially based. That's all I care about. And, and what do you do? Keep your eye on the, on the, uh, on the spread differentials of, of those vehicles that we can trade. Um, let me just get up and take a look right now. Uh, See. What are you looking at? You're looking at the uh... yeah. I mean, it, now the BTBs did probably rally today because you know I don't know. Again, we don't know the numbers in in real time. It's not like the Fed, even though nobody's really paying attention to what the Fed does. Anyway. We just watch, of course, the market action. And again, I haven't traded Treasuries in any kind of spread basis in quite a while. I did trade some Euro dollar spreads the other day because I thought they had gotten on the uh, DEES 2021, I thought they had gotten a little too far. They had inverted a little too much. So pick up a tick here or there, nothing much. But you just pay attention. Now I would actually, I'm watching and I was short some uh, BTBs coming in. I, I was doing a butterfly along the French, short the Bund and short the BTB, but I covered them as soon as the, the strength in the Euro has been. Now I'm not sure it'll work today, has been indicative of some late uh, Italian uh, uh, buy, um, bond purchases. And I don't, it's probably ECB related, of course. But when the euro is not weak, then people, oh, you know what? There seems to be a uh, settling in that, well, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen today. There's no falling apart today because you could see it in the euro. But, and, and I'm going to entertain this. Give it, because you're gonna, I'm preempting my Sunday blog, but here, here it comes. That's what you pay me the big money for. Um, Trump's discussion yesterday, and I chatted with you, Judd, about it. Yeah. About the dollar is out of this mind. He's <laughs> out of his mind. And whoever is whispering in his ear that this is a good road to take, it's a terrible road to take. Uh, the dollar strength, it will be a disaster. 
You cannot do this. And then if you go back, and I went back and listened to, re-listened to uh, the Powell interview on Tuesday. I don't know, is everybody following here? I mean, because I know I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, synthesize this into, and not leave it out there. But, you know, Powell on, on Tuesday in the interview, he actually got asked a question by um, Adam Posen uh, about the dollar. Now, he really didn't answer the question. He just talked about why they opened the swap lines. And he said, provide dollars to foreign markets, reduce the safety premium in dollar markets. Uh, and, he's, and they do this, as he said, they're just, they use it as a way to buy time as a uh, hopefully reach some sense of normalcy. And he admitted that, listen, the world's, the dollar is the world's reserve currency and dollar funding markets are important for the U.S. economy. And they don't want a flight to safety. So that's, you know, that's what they're talking about. So now, you know, and, and, and I'm not political. And I've been in a very gray area for Trump because there's certain things I think that he's done, which I don't like the way the message is delivered, but the policy, and that's what I care about is the policy, has been somewhat positive. And this is over the last three years. But this dollar and the way he's flipped, because he was weak dollar, weak dollar, weak dollar, weak dollar, weak dollar. And now all of a sudden he talks about the benefits. Where's that piece? There's a writer story. Oh, here it is. This is from yesterday. Trump pivots to embrace a strong U.S. dollar. Uh, and it says, it's a great time to have a strong dollar. I'm quote, this is a quote. Everybody wants to be the dollar because we kept it strong. I kept it strong. Now, this is absolutely insanity. Insanity. Because here he was trumpeting a weak dollar when it was a trade issue. Now we can argue about that, but uh, whether good, bad, or different. But the dollar as a trade issue is far different than the dollar as a financial instrument. And when even Powell says we're the reserve currency, the Fed's not supposed to talk about the currency, which he avoided. He really did not, because that's the uh, value of the treasure. And of course, uh, I haven't heard from Mnuchin, but if one of these goddamn journalists who would ask a decent question, they should get they should get Mnuchin out there and say, well, what do you think about the dollar? And let's find out what the real policy is. Because, you know, my supposition, and now of course, you know, the dollar is down from after he spoke, which is kind of interesting. We see the euro, euros it may actually close higher on the week. I'm well, it's euro lossy that's running it. Yeah, you know what? Yes, in, in, some, in some regards, that's right. Yeah, the Aussie, you know, it's the, the Aussie is way too strong against the Kiwi, by the way. So when the Aussies, when, when the Australians do their next monetary policy, pay attention to that, because with the Aussie Kiwi up at 107.5, 108, it's too strong, especially with what's going on in the world. Um, the... Uh, but the, a strong dollar is not what is warranted here. This is, this is insanity. This is, I, I'm, I, I go back and again, I think I talked about it last time. There's a famous uh, pamphlet written by Keynes in 1925 called The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill. And Keynes ripped Churchill in real time when Churchill put Britain back on the gold standard which proved a disaster at the time. A strong dollar is that equivalent. You do not want a strong dollar. The world cannot tolerate a strong dollar now. Those dollars strong because there's a shortage of dollars. And that's really what Powell was speaking to. And Trump is not helping the situation. So my sense is, if I step back, because he's a buffoon, but he's not an idiot. And somebody is whispering in his ear, and he thinks, you know, don't forget, he has bested Powell. He's got, even before the virus, he got Powell to pivot. And the more he raised tariffs, the more the Fed had to pivot away from the policy when they were busy raising rates and shrinking the balance sheet. 
because it was having a negative impact. And Trump would dangle those tariffs in an effort, I think, to get lower interest rates because, you know, that's just the way he's cut, whether they're good, bad, or different. He thinks that it's a pile of things. That's why he talks about negative interest rates. So is he talking a strong dollar to try to get the Fed to go negative interest rates, which would be a disaster in its own right? I, but whoever has his ear, you know what? Larry Kudlow should resign because he has nothing to say here. He's a, he's a withering idiot. I, honestly, I'm sorry to be on record. I'm saying this. It's just too convoluted. And if they're letting this dollar, this strong dollar policy come out of his mouth, they're all responsible. And it's a mistake of gargantuan proportions. I, I can't be more, uh, more uh, dynamic in explaining this because a strong dollar would actually push prices lower on a global basis because everybody in a hurry to dump all their excess capacity. And that's what they're worried about. The Fed is worried about a deflationary spiral. Stop this man from talking. The dollar going up would be an absolute disaster. But maybe because he talks about it going higher, it'll go lower. But, but we'll see. But it's, it's, it's a disaster. And if he's doing it to pressure the Fed, it's a mistake also. You know, back off. Interest rates are, are at zero. Let things start to develop here. Stop pushing at it. But uh, you can see, I, I get, I'm not, I'm usually much more measured. This is, I'm a little more than perturbed about this because the advisors who are out there ought to be commenting on it and there, and there is nothing. There's nothing. They're letting him run loose here. And I want to know who's pushing this. Is this more of the Navarro doctrine? We're here, we hear from that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a Navarro fan whatsoever because the Navarro doctrine is, well, if it's bad for China, it must be good for the U.S. You might want to rethink that. Uh, well, he's looking like they want to start World War II again, you know, all over again. It is. And if we, if we want to get there, we can discuss that because all the actions are very aggressive, uh, bellicose actions that need to be toned down. It's just, really, you want to redo the 30s? Well, we'll redo the 30s. Yeah, that's in Ira. That's uh, the '30s anal analogy. You know, was uh, tr competitive devaluations and trade. You know, yeah. beggar thy neighbor policies, right? Yeah. Right. It's, but it was might, so much it's more. It's not good that. timing for that kind of stuff right now. No, it, and and if you listen to what again, what Powell thought, they're all afraid of a deflationary spiral. I'm sorry, a strong dollar it, it gets you that. You want to keep bashing China. China's got, you know, again, they have cards to play too. And they're not, you know what? And they, and they keep firing back. So yeah, maybe, you know, uh, the rhetoric will get toned down and we'll actually get something. You know, forget about the trade deal that was made. It's it's ridiculous. What, tell me what a 200, 300 billion dollar trade deal means in the face of uh, GNP, GDP dropping uh, uh, three trillion, okay? But it's meaningless. And why would you push it? Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. And you saw, if you saw the, the numbers, Chinese imports of soybeans from Brazil were enormous. And you know what a lot of that has to do with? The weak reality of you morons. The weaker the real is, the more the Chinese buy from the Brazilians. Here. Chinese are the ultimate bargain hunters. I mean, they find them, they sniff out a bargain. Oh, you know what? Because, because what are they going to do? They're, they're going to, you know, crush them. They're gonna, they, they'll make so much money reselling them out there. Right? Yeah. That's why, stop talking. You need a weaker dollar. A stronger dollar is not helping you. I mean, what do you think the advantage is? Say, so, Judd, is... Uh, is the yuan acting anything this week? Is it doing anything, or is it strangely stronger? It, yeah, it, it's weaker, is and, it? and and you know you that's what up? I was saying. Can, that can you put it but, up? Yeah, when uh, what I was looking at on the spreads when Ira was talking about the euro, I'm not quite sure how much of that is just people buying euros, taking profits in silver and gold again, and there's some of that going on too. Look at the, the Brazilian real since the November soybean harvest in the U.S. is down about 
Can we say that again? Down 40%. We were at four ray out to the dollar. We're now at 5.8. Yes. Yes, Ira. This is Robert Seco. And we're seeing this also in our egg manufacturing. We Thank had to, run to resource manufacturing into Brazil frantically because it's just a very uneconomical to purchase parts in Italy or Germany and assemble them in Brazil. Exactly spot on. Yeah, and look at this, the Real actually put in an ORL yesterday, which is a strengthening Real, probably after the, after the Chinese did their grain trade. You know what, really, I, again, my frustration is there's really no sense of policy. And there was actually a really good Lighthizer article in the New York Times this week, or was it during one of them? And, you know, laying out what Trump has done. And it was actually a very balanced and fair article. But somebody needs to shut this guy up. And if the journalists don't go out and get Mnuchin, they need to put Mnuchin right on the firing line. Tell us what the dollar policy is, because it's always spoken about from the, uh, from the uh, Secretary of Treasury. Tell me, do you really want a strong dollar policy? Great. Great. Then you know what? Let's just all get along, all the bonds, and watch it implode, because it will. It, a strong dollar is disastrous. I, it, it is really, I mean, I'm, this is my Sunday blog, and it's, it's been driving me crazy for two days, and I'm making money. Trust me, I, I'm trading it right, because I see other things, and I, I go, no, you can't really believe that. So, you know, I just step back. Is Trump Mac Machiavellian enough to play that card, keep talking up the dollar to move uh, Powell? But if he moves Powell to go to negative, you know, if the dollar were to get strong, it would be disastrous. Look at U.S. bank stocks. Look at European bank stocks. By what measure do you, can you uh, tell me what the health of the economy is? Look at the regionals. And I was really bullish on the regionals until the onset of COVID. But what they're facing in the, in the commercial real estate market, I mean, you, you better well damn do your homework if you're buying any of these. Uh, it's, there is real pain to be had. And a stronger dollar is not going to help your situation. This is really, it's, you may as well go on the gold standard. Make no mistake, this is, and somebody needs to call it out. And it was interesting that Adam Posen, when he interviewed Powell on, uh, what day was that? Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, I think. yeah, Wednesday. Uh, that he got to the dollar question, but he didn't push him on it. And he really should have, talking about the importance, you know, you know how you see this, because it, it affects what Fed policy is gonna do. The Fed doesn't set dollar policy, but of course we know that with interest rates, it can certainly impact dollar policy. If you went to negative, if you went to negative interest rates, the dollar would, I think, you know, wind up uh, in 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 problems because it would force a lot of people to to get out of the United States assets. But this is a really sensitive issue, and it needs to be called out. I mean, so much of this discussion is played out on my blog. And all this, everybody's bullish the dollar. Well, you know, I'm, as you've known, I have not been, I'm not bullish the dollar. And I know what that chart looks like on the dollar index, but I'm, I'm really interested in watching how the euro closes out this week. Let's see. Yeah, we're, we're really playing with it. Uh, I've got one play on. I'm not, I'm out of basically everything. I'm pissed I missed the gold. I missed the silver first. I mean, I caught some of it. But. Hey, say Ira. Yes. Do you have any kind of macro uh, backdrop of what's why silver is popping and could, is, no. it, is it going to assume like a, a lead over gold for a while here or, or, or maybe yeah. not or what do you think? It's still weird. And what, uh, hold on. What's that? 104? Yeah, but it, 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 Peter, it was the gold silver that broke out. Yes. And we talked about it yesterday in the room and I didn't get focused on it because I saw the breakout and I knew it, you had at least 50 cents in it. And it, you know, it went right up to the 200 day and stopped. And now I think that whole that whole flow is yeah. done for the day. Yeah, I you think you've seen the high in the gold and the high in the silver I, for the rest of the day. You know what? We're, we're sitting at 103.80. Okay, so 
quickly. We're still, the previous all-time high was like at 98 or 99. We went up all the way to 120 or 121. I'm talking about silver to gold. Yeah. As people are waking up to, hey, I better get some hard assets because nothing is, you know, when I watch CNBC and they talk like today and I never turn it on anymore. It's really, because I can't listen to the, you know, if it's down, they bring out, you know, somebody who's bearish, of course, you know, the old thing, but they're always, well, the, but they, when they saw today's retail sales number, and I wanted to see it in real time, and it's the fastest source I have outside of some online stuff. But uh, when, I, when I listen to them talk, I, what, were, what, you're surprised that auto sales are down that dramatically? I know. Oh, I really, they're shocked. I go, what world are you living in? What world are you living in? Who's that's going? Like, I, that, that news is like five weeks old. <laughs> I, if, if you haven't sensed this, now down here in Arizona where things are starting to open up. Believe me, I, I actually went out to dinner on what they say on Wednesday night. My wife and I first time was a pleasure. I mean, we ate outside. Everybody who waited on us or served us a drink had a mask on and gloves. Nice. And and you know we kept our we were outside, kept our distance. And my daughter, who's a chef went back to work Wednesday. She worked Wednesday, Thursday. And, you know, again, they're not going to be serving as many people, but they, they are, you know, starting to make some sense. You know what? And I get, we give big tips to everybody because, you know, everybody in, in the service industry has really gotten whacked, you know, and they're really appreciative because it's you know, been, their, their customer capacity has got to be cut in half or something. At even, least half. Even, even when they're open, it's going to be cut in half. Right. That's why Danny Myers, who I give a shit about uh, with his New York restaurants. Oh, I'm not opening because I can't, you know, it's being at half capacity isn't, isn't the dining experience. You know what? Here, dine on this. Well, hey, back to silver. Uh, do you see any, any, I, I have a comment yesterday, the first one, yeah. silver reported its earnings. Yeah, and the CEO is really pissed at what he sees as massive manipulation on silver prices and the paper market and the futures exchanges. You mean keeping it down? Yeah, keeping it down, suppressing it, and and then you're seeing like spot physical silver markets pricing way way above the futures market. Like, well, eight, you know, eight, eight, like there's an eight dollar an ounce premium on silver coins. Uh, yeah, may, maybe you know that's what he. Well, there is. You can go right online and see it. It's I know. Right I know. But that's what he wants is, you know, that's what this well, well, the point I'm saying is this, he's, he actually, uh, uh, for the end of March stopped, he started stop. he started hoarding his silver, stopped putting it in the market. He says that that's not the price and I'm not going to sell it till the price was higher. And he was right. He's already gotten over $2 more. No, that's right. And I've argued with people, you know, cause I've been more bullish silver at these, you know, you know but silver does suffer a little bit under a lower industrial use. Uh, yes, and so therefore, I think you've had a lot of the algo-driven trades. You know, you watch it because silver will trade more with copper than it will with gold, which is highly unusual in the bullish precious metals market. But look at platinum. You know, yeah. a lot of story. so there are it's not so straightforward. It's not so straightforward that it's being manipulated. You know what? Somebody, somebody is shorted, right? And if, and if the fundamentals were underlying so good, those shorts, just like they got run in with the gold, they'll get run in. And I, I still think it's going to happen. One of the, run in on, on a physical delivery demand, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And one of the things, as, well, I'm glad we're talking about this. Somebody go and do the work to see how many deliveries for May Silver there's been at the, at the, C, at the COMEX. That would be interesting. Because remember, there was a big spread differential between, um, well, at that time, March and then May. But that spread, and I've been watching the spread differential, you know, that spot silver has come in. In fact, it's actually sometimes spots traded over the July. So if somebody will go back and do the work, I'm not doing it. I'm tired. I've done too much of this. Go look to see how many deliveries there, there have been at the, at the COMEX. Because there may be a lot of silver coming out. Don't forget, the, in, the interesting thing about the oil play, okay, and what happened in the gold market, is that it woke up some of these hedge funds that have kind of lost their way going, you know, and don't know really what they're doing as far as, am I a hedger? But 
if they start putting their billions of dollars to work in the cash metal market, they could absolutely drive these markets crazy. Now, I lost the CME election. I'm off the board. So I can discuss things as the way I see them in a much more uh, forthright okay. manner than I, I could before. I just Good. couldn't. Ears are open. Ears are open. Yeah, well, they yeah. voted you off the island. That's their short-sightedness. Yeah, um, they're, yes. Yeah, because they think they can roll back 30 years in time. Yeah, good luck to that. So, you know, they got guys who, who know uh, how to put a deck together but don't know anything about the, the deck of global trading. So good luck to you. Yeah, well, that's uh, how they made their money. So, um, and that's not sour grapes, it's just reality. I, I accept, you know, it, it is. But be very aware of what could go on here because there's so much cash floating around looking for things to do. And again, if I ran a $10, $20 billion fund, I would stockpiling uh, physical silver like mad just to push you know, because it's a good trade to push historical limits. Okay, you I, think the, I think the total market cap of physical silver is only like $18 billion. Not too. So, yeah, it's pretty easy to do, right? Yeah, so well, that's, nothing, that's nothing in today's world at all. That's nothing at all. The Mays go off the 27th and there's, you know, 50 contracts traded. The May? And what's, yeah. the, open in, what's the open interest? Um... What is the open interest? It's not. Well, let me see. It's not giving me uh, open interest, 378. Yeah, so okay. Now the key is how many were delivered? So well, you, you, have is, a, you, you yeah. still have a week. Right, no, no, but that's 378 left. Don't forget, delivery start, uh, first notice day is like April 29th or April 30th. So, okay. okay. So if somebody will do it, otherwise nobody does, just write me a note if remember and I'll go, you can go to check, the exchange should, will provide that information. How many delivered? How many, uh, how many contracts were delivered? Because believe me, somebody's gonna be playing with this. They saw what happened in the oil, they saw what happened in the gold, they're playing with, they'll play with it. Me? As of today, they say eight deliveries. Maybe that's just today. I that's, don't just know that's, that's just today. That's just yeah. today. That's just today. It's no yeah. way it's eight deliveries. So, it's, so the, the CEO of First Majestic yeah. might be positioning. He's already got over a million ounces last and He might have two or three million ounces before you know it. And yeah. he, might, he might position that so he could, he could uh, you know, yeah, profit from a delivery squeeze or or sell it on a delivery squeeze to a desperate buyer. No, no, that's right. That's right. You know, and then do the, is there the refinery capacity? You know, there's going to be a lot of games start to be played now. As traders, it'll get interesting, but it it will get wild. I don't know when. I, I don't know when, but people have woken up to wow. You know what? I've got all this cash. How can I? You know. Mm, you know, you you see two stepping into Bitcoin. I mean, people are looking, and and the global macro people, my people, in the way that we think, not necessarily the way we trade or invest. They've had a pretty good run here, and this is a group that when they get some real wind in their sails, and they've and they've got uh, house money to play with, they get really aggressive. That's why you've seen the algos get, you know, beat up in some ways, but they're back, you know, looking for correlations. But we'd like to see them break down that uh, silver industrial metal correlation and just go to, you know, where silver would, uh, again, is poor man's gold, it's people looking for alternatives. Where are you putting your money? You buying real estate today? God bless you, because if you can figure that out uh, as to where that goes, uh, that's going to be, I think, uh, depression numbers in the commercial real estate market, not just because of the bankruptcies. We've got all that property. And we, we talked about this months and months ago, that WeWork was a problem because they had taken off so much real estate, but then as their business model was starting to fail badly, all that property was going to come on the market during good times and prices were starting to get depressed. So, 
there's a lot of moving parts here. It's not quite as easy as a lot of people want you to believe. It's, it's, it's just not going to be that way. It's not where we are in uh, demand shock times where, and you see it in the retail sales number and they're not coming, even in China, which is, you know, but, but their retail numbers were terrible. The manufacturing numbers were better, but that's not, that's worse for the deflation argument. Cause if they're, if they're, increasing their manufacturing, they're going to be dumping product all over the world. Not good for pricing. So get off the strong dollar. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm being very uh, animated today. That's all right. We like it. Nah, it's not my... Yeah, I know. But it's good to get a rise out of you once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Rob. This is yeah. Rob Seiko. Uh, yes, Robert. They take advantage of your animation and just just on a more of a higher 10,000 feet level question. Yeah, I'm observing number one that, you know, not a, not a big mystery. I'm not rediscovering America. Fed is getting closer to Treasury. Sometimes I even don't see, you know, who is doing what, or how, how they're supposed to. Uh, the, there is so much talk about buy, government buying ETFs even. So my question is following, are we witnessing the transformation of capital markets into political utilities that no longer behave freely? You know, zombifying the whole thing, like, like Japan. Yes. Yeah, because they've gotten too big. And when, again, it's been going on for, you know, 10 years, because as soon as the Fed broke the signaling mechanism of the bond markets and capital markets per se. We've been in that. They were hoping to escape from it. Again, as they called it, escape velocity, but gravity keeps bringing them back. And it's the gravity of way too much debt in the system, which they've helped perpetuate because their solution to everything was more debt. Well, it's, it's and, and all the, 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 the situation that we're in is really that the, the COVID-19 was the catalyst to unleash uh, all the negative forces from having too much debt. It was gonna be some event and, and we've just debt on top of debt on top. And what was it, what's the number that uh, the Institute of International Finance says that from 2008 to the present going into this crisis, we had taken on 80 trillion more in debt on a global basis. That's a, that's a lot. That's I gotta tell you, and the Fed is, does a lousy job of painting the tape. They should hire somebody from the bank in Agara 20, 30 years ago. Well, yeah, I've, as I've said, hire me, I'll show <laughs> the bank. I, I'll give you a bang for your buck, trust me. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 can, I can get this job done. Hell, I'll go hire Henry Kaufman and make a speech beforehand. Then I can really get it going. Oh, wait, that's Solomon, brother. Oh, that's right, sorry. Um, no. So Ira, here, let me, let me take the flip side of the coin on you with the dollar thing. Okay. okay. Yep. Um, you know, markets can be, quote unquote, manipulated for what? short periods of for short periods of time, you know, by the Fed, fiscal policy, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, the power of the cycle and the trend eventually, you know, sinks its teeth in. So if the Fed did what you suggest, take a trillion bucks and go buy a whole bunch of foreign currencies to weaken the dollar, yep. all right? My personal feeling, all right, ba based on the past, um, but obviously there can be unexpected outcomes, is that that might work for a day, two days, maybe a week, and then the trend, the overall, the overwhelming trend of deflation, et cetera, et cetera, re-exerts itself, and then you're right back to square one. Okay. What do you think? That, that is a very fair point to raise. But it's because every time you, you say, take a trillion bucks, that's yeah. what goes through my head. And I say to myself, that's great for a three-day trade, but what do you do after that? 
Oh no, you, 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 I, it's a very fair critical point, but you, I'll get, so maybe I'll take another choice. I will get to the point where I'll break the back of it. I got the positive cord to prove that. I can break the back right. of it. All right, I, we can, so then we can go to, so let's say we go to two trillion, three trillion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's say it takes five trillion to, to actually break the trend. Okay. Okay, but what, what's the unexpected consequence of that? Oh, well, I mean, that's why my mantra has been to be long gold in a deflationary. <laughs> it might, you know, yeah. it's, not the, it's not the inflation because it's how far are you going to go when you have to break it. And, well, let's, let's flip that around again. Now I'm going to flip it on you. What the cost-benefit analysis to that? What, what's the benefit you're going to get? Now, well, it, it all depends on which constituency you want to play to. Do you want okay. to play to the constituency of the farmers or do you want to play to the constituency of the American consumer? Well, that's also a good question because if the American consumer, I'm going to argue that the strong dollar is not helping the American consumer right now because it's negligible. If, you, if I look and I look at the dollar, the dollar really, it's on its high side, but what's falling to the American consumer, because demand is falling off. So why is it, the consumer is not really benefiting. They're not buying. You're not, nobody's going, if you're not going out to buy a car, do you care that cars are, you know, 10% uh, cheaper? No, what's the difference? What's no, the difference? I mean, not, not at the moment, not at the moment, no. Right, so you'd actually be better off with inflation because that would minimize your debt. But this is, this is the, the, the fine line that monetary policy has to always walk. But you know, you, you make a trillion dollars something, but Nancy Pelosi is going to put a, put a $3 trillion additional spending bill in the, in the Congress. So you've just seen the Fed ramp up its balance sheet $3 trillion in the last month and a half. What's another trillion? And at least you'll get yeah. <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but that's the situation in which we live in. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I, I guess I look at it more from an absolutist point of view. And what I mean by that is none of these solutions solve the actual overall economic problem that has been brewing for the past 12 years. Oh, right? The debt, the debt problem and everything. You know, so, you know, everything is just some sort of stopgap measure to get us over a very short bridge, you know, but then eventually we, we, we end up facing the same kinds of problems again. And and the concept of, you know, we're doing nothing but pulling whatever demand is left forward, uh, you know. At, yeah. OK, yeah. now, I, I don't know, Ira, I don't know how much demand is actually left other than, you know, pent up demand from everybody being shut in. But that's a, that, that, that's a different can of worms. Something that you're never going to recruit. And let, let me ask you the other side of the coin, which is how long does unemployment stay at double digits? Oh, uh, you, you got that right. And, and how much of um, continuing claims ends up being structurally unemployed? Well, again, but this is a very critical issue to this whole thing, okay? And it's why the metals are the metals, or the precious metals. Because, look, it, we now have the floor for unemployment. And I'll use the, the model that I hate the most and have been most critical of probably my entire life of academia and trading, which is the Phillips curve. Okay, so at 3.5% unemployment, you couldn't even hit the... Fed's uh, inflation bogey or the ECB's inflation bogey or the BOJ, you know, at full employment, then you couldn't hit the inflation bogey. So now you know that that's three and a half percent. So tell me at your best guess when we get back to 4% unemployment, 5% unemployment. Tell me, because then I can tell you what the Fed policy has a chance of being. But otherwise, sit back and relax because watch this show. Yeah. The only way the Phillips curve works, Ira, is if the United States becomes a self-contained unit. No imports, yes. no exports. Absolutely. Okay? 
that we, right. we become an island where we, unless we're an island unto ourselves, uh, the Phillips curve is completely useless. A absolutely. That's why when I was on with Santelli for how many times ad nauseum, in fact, I was going to actually wear a Nehru jacket out once <laughs> because, you know, before we call, you know, the Fed in, in Bernanke in, and the, the mathematicians like to call it the non-accelerating in interest, the non-accelerating non inflation rate of unemployment, NARU, N-A-I, that's the acronym. But I say it's yeah. NARU because, again, it, when you're in a global economy and money is allowed to arbitrage uh, labor costs, meaning search out its lowest cost workers, which is what's been going on since 1989 in the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then, of course, China coming on. So money has flown or floated around the world searching out the lowest cost. And because transportation has accelerated in its efficiencies, it was able to do it. But that's, what, that's the arbitrage. That's where Thomas uh, Piketty has had it absolutely right in his, and simplistically, uh, rates are, are, meaning rates of return on capital are higher than growth. Why? Because we arbitrage labor costs. That's what we've done. That's right. Oh yeah, yeah. Hundred percent right. If we closed off the borders, then then the Phillips curves. But that's an awfully well. The academics are so arrogant that they might want to do that just to prove that, that model is right. Uh, sure. Then, then then you can get the velocity of money to pick up steam. You know, right. Hundred percent. Yeah. Because you'd be a self-contained unit. Good luck with that. Yeah. And then, and then you'd have all the printed cash chasing fewer goods, and there and there you go. But um, you know, we do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that that you know that then what what would the unexpected outcomes of that be on the? Uh, I mean, well, you know, th then it, then it speaks to the issue of the dollar as a reserve currency, so on and so forth, and then you have all sorts of things that are going to break. Well, listen, then you better well mothball all the all the aircraft carriers because there's no reason for it. What are you spending all that money for? Yep. Yeah, that's you know, a good point. <laughs> you, the military is there to keep the sea lanes open. Just like with the British Navy. Why did, why did the British Empire work? Because the British Navy was the most dynamic uh, military force in the world. And it could ensure that sea lanes stayed open. Hey, you know what? Uh, I, I want to shift gears for a second to Europe. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, you, I know you're familiar with Richard Koo, right? Very familiar. Yeah, I've read, yeah. read most of these um, He recently came up with um, a, a, an interesting idea with respect to the European debt situation. So he said, look, until you have a, a – well, uh, I'm not sure everyone here understands what the term balance sheet recession means, but you and I do. Yes. Um, but it, a quick summary for anyone you know listening is is that's when individuals, corporations, and potentially governments actually do the right thing and start paying down debt to reliquify their balance sheets and raise cash and save instead of spending, and um, that that's what he terms the the balance sheet recession. Now, an interesting thing about Europe, he said. What if we do fiscal unity in reverse? And what he meant by that is you let oh, – the Sp Spanish people can buy buns, they can buy oats, right? They can buy whatever they want. And he said, what if we just say that the Spanish people can only buy bonos, the Italians can only buy – um, uh, BTBs, et cetera, et cetera. That way the cash stays in the country, right? And it can get used by the government to do whatever it is they need to do and minimize the effects of the balance sheet recession that's taking place in places like Spain. Uh, he said Germany, they did it from, uh, what, 2000 to roughly 2006. Germany did that. Right, but Germany also had the global economy in the, working in their favor. But that I thought that was a really interesting 
way to, you know, deal with cash leaving Spain, cash leaving uh, uh, Italy, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because he said that those countries, the, the individual balance sheets of, of their citizens are in pretty good shape. But the problem is they're not spending because they're paying down debt, right? But, but when they pay down that de uh, um, uh, their personal debt and reliquify their personal balance sheets, you know, that cash is going to other countries and not staying inside of their own country. Uh, so the way to mi mitigate that. On that. What? How, how much do you think these guys actually um, declare in their own country and how much of their income of the big industrialists and all those people are all off book in gray market? All right. Well, I didn't say I fully understood it because if, if that were to happen, I don't know what the role of the ECB would be. You know, yeah. so I, so, so I, I'm, I'm just mentioning it because yeah. he, he threw yeah. that out there the other day and I'm, I'm still trying to digest it. Okay. So I, I haven't, I, I know that he's been writing a little bit. I haven't seen much, but I saw somebody in Europe discuss, you know, brought up, oh, maybe it was Daniel LeCal. I, I don't know, somebody brought up Richard Ku uh, recently. So uh, the whole concept of the balance sheet recession, though, I mean, that's, he just really made it fairly easy to so why you don't come out of these things. And, and like he was right on target in 2007, eight and nine, because people were going to repair their balance sheets, banks and everybody else. That's why you get into recessions on a classic basis because you get overextended. You, then you start saving and what Keynes called the paradox of thrift, which is the more you save, it's like people are now talking about, well, people have all these pent up savings right now in the United States. You know, there's somebody just wrote a long piece about it. And he, and he goes, that's not a good thing, by the way. You know, everybody, they, well, then, but, but it's really not because number one, it's, it's crushing demand as people start to save money and as people are worried. And your open statement was, when you keep bringing demand forward, which you do in a debt-based system, you keep bringing demand forward because I'm able to borrow money. So I'll have to think about that. But if, if you're a Spanish citizen, are you gonna put money in a Spanish bank or a German bank? And really what he's talking about then is, is exchange controls, even though you all have the same currency, you just won't let it flow out. Because if I'm an Italian, I'm not, I've learned with, uh, with, um, uh, with um, Montesci, I'm not going for that. Why should I keep my money in an Italian bank when they're going to do bail-ins rather than bail-outs? And that's when they, they attack the savings of, uh, of savings accounts over a certain level. Well, can you imagine if I had my money at JP Morgan and JP Morgan got into trouble and, all, and if I had, had 400,000, all of a sudden 200,000 went to bail out JP Morgan? Because that's what bail yeah. is. The same thing that happened yeah. in Cyprus. These are dangerous, dangerous concepts. So I, why would I keep my money there? And if you're going to force me to do it, you're at the end of the, you're, you know, we're, we're, you don't have a European Union anyway. So I, that's, my, that's my first take on it. So I'd have to think more about it because I have a lot of respect. For, I think Richard Koo is one of the better voices out there and he explains things very well. Uh, but we, we are in some interesting times only because we, we, you know, how creative are you going to be to get out of this stuff? But if I'm a European, if I'm a European, I am certainly not going to hold it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to shop banks and look for the strongest hands I can, I can be in. And again, there are people who, who've been writing on the blog, oh, well, if Germany goes back to the Deutschmark. Okay. If that's a concept, a possibility, I would rather be in Deutschmarks than I would be in euros, right? Can we agree on that? Sure. And if the and in order for the for the Germans to quit the EU and go back to the Deutschmark, they're going to have now. I can tell you, you know, every currency in the that made up the euro 
it had an exchange value fixed to it on January 1st, 1999 in order to do the valuation of the Euro, which I think launched on January 1st, 1999. Judd, you can bear it out if you go to the, uh, uh, I, I think it was 117.80 was the launch and you can go figure out, you know, what each currency valued at. So that's not gonna happen. So if, if the weaker countries are left with the Euro, that's what they take and the Germans and the Dutch and whoever else go on their way and they go into a, a Deutschmark block. Well, as an Italian, right now I'm stuffing all my money I can into German banks if I think that's a possibility. So then it becomes, you know, uh, as they teach you uh, Econ 101, uh, ergo hoc, post Proctor hoc, it becomes a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're gonna make it happen. So th there is no easy answer to this. But I'll tell you what, no. if you think the Germans can pull the plug here, it will be expensive for the entire world. The losses to the European banking system and to German and French banks, because they're loaded to the gills, by the way, with Italian debt and Greek debt, just like they were in 2015. Hey, Ira, I agree with you, it would be a mess, but isn't it inevitable? No. It's no. Not. No, I because well, I would make it. You know what, I, I, I guess it's which devil, which devil do you want to entertain? The devil of inflation, in order to potentially solve some of the problem. Uh, the potential of the devil of um, bank defaults, as a as another potential outcome. That you know, each outcome has a different devil that we'd have to deal with, no, and I don't know which one is worse. No question about it. Each one that is so well put, each one has a different devil to deal with. And that's the truth. And see, but the arrogant economist like Rogoff, and he is, he's very bright, but when you listen to him, he, he's so damn certain, you know, as, as, as they would say on the trading floor, when times were good, you know, about guys who were, you know, terrible traders, uh, never in doubt, seldom right. And that's so many of these theoreticians. In fact, uh, I don't know if anybody saw Epsilon Theory's piece yesterday. Oh man, and Hunt, <laughs> this man, he's enraged. Um, but they build these models and yeah, they're great. And that's what they're hoping for. They're all hoping for five or 6% inflation. Now, you know, if you say, well, Ira, why do you say that? Well, go, why don't you go read Rogoff's book, you know, this time, this time is different that he wrote with uh, Carmen Reinhardt. And that was the solution to a lot of resolution of the debt situation is some inflation. Three or four years of 5%, 6% of inflation, which would get you neg negative real yields of, you know, let's say seven or 8%, or, you know, or at least 6%. You know, the, the problem with Japan and why it has struggled to come out of it, this is the lesson that they learned was Japan had real deflation. So even though they had zero interest rates, real yields in Japan were still two, two and a half percent, which is why the yen went higher. Just for another lesson for Donald Trump. Because if you get into the and, and Ira, even, even the inflation game, I'm, I'm uncertain, you know, how that would ultimately solve the problem. And the reason I say it is, you know, do governments suddenly stop spending in order to in, to let inflation inflate away the amount of debt, oh, because no, otherwise, uh, okay, yeah, exactly, exactly. So so, uh, you know, they keep adding on more debt, saying we need more inflation to pay to help minimize the amount of the debt, but they, they never get off the treadmill, or the well, gerbil never gets off his wheel. Well, that's why they're talking about that instead of targeting inflation target not GDP, because that's, that's the real bogey, because if I have nominal GDP, which is, you know, includes inflation, and it's 8%, and real GDP is 1.5%, but I'm paying back uh, my, credit, my creditors at nominal GDP. So I, if I can grow the economy 8%, yeah, then the Laffer curve works. I'll grow my way out of this. But it's what Irving Fisher famously, you know, the monetary illusion. That's what inflation is. It's money. Yeah. Illusion. 
So in that scenario, Ira, maybe you, pro maybe you get corporations and individuals repairing their balance sheets, sure. but the ones with the screwed up balance sheets end up being uh, the sovereigns. Yeah, but you know, as they famously say, nations don't go broke. Really? Go take a look at Argentina. They're under ninth ball. So that, yeah. you know, that was Mike Milken's point. That's why he really elevated the junk bond market. And he said, what do you mean? Of course, nations go broke. The history of the world is nations going broke, overextending themselves. And you know what? It's my problem. And I attack the, uh, well, as uh, Sokolov calls the magic money tree or MMT. Actually, the people who promote MMT as, a, as, a, um, as an anti-war person, an anti-military person, I understand wars, and I understand historically the importance of it. I'm, I am an anti-military guy. I believe that military spending is an inflationary drag on an economy. It's not productive. Yes, you do get some benefits out of it. I know all the, all the uh, military industrial complex people will tell me all the benefits we've had, but that assumes that we wouldn't have gotten better research spending elsewhere. I, I'm, I'm very aware of it. But yeah. MMT, you make wars easy to finance. And that to me is the worst, one of the worst parts about it because there's no limit to my spending. I got a printing press. I don't have to worry. It's it's you know Lyndon Johnson, guns and butter, 1965. It's uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, socialism, socialist takeover of the economy. But yeah, it, you know what? And wars become way too easy, way too easy because I got a printing press. And if there's no cost to it, well, you know, I, I learned that back in 1965. I was uh, 12 years old, 13 years old, and I could understand the concept of guns and butter. Believe it or not. That made perfect sense. I actually had an eighth grade debate about it. <laughs> That's when you actually learn something in school. Um, but very, you know what? Linda Johnson wouldn't raise taxes. And that really set everything in motion to, you know, having to leave the gold standard, you know, or it was never a gold standard. It was the gold exchange standard. But really, you know, the end of Bretton Woods, it's because Johnson, you know, hey, I wanted a free ride. And he got a free ride up until the point that it be couldn't become... Uh, Finance, but if if I'm a if, if I'm a left leaning liberal, I am not in favor of MMT if I really think through it, because it's too easy to finance global wars. I mean, you could say right now it is we do whatever we want, but yeah, maybe beyond that, and everybody else will get into it too, going eh, just turn on the printing presses. There has to be some accountability, which is really what we're talking about, but. It, believe me, inflation is their end game here. Because again, it's an asymmetric, and, and I'm gonna finish with this. You have to understand that the central bank, all central banks feeling beliefs now after Paul Volcker succeeded in crushing inflation in the early 80s, is that it's asymmetric. Banks know how to stop inflation. They don't know how to, well, I, I won't say, they do know how to start it, but to break the back of a deflationary spiral is something that they really struggle with, which is why we are where we are, because they will do everything to, st to stop a, a sense that we're going into a deflationary spiral, which I'll tie, the, again, this is like a good Seinfeld, we'll bring it all to fruition, which is why Trump needs to shut up and stop talking about the, a stronger dollar. This is when he should be talking about a weaker dollar. So I just, I, I challenge the motivation. And you know what? Jack Mnuchin out there and ask him what the motivation of a strong dollar is. Put him, put his feet to the fire and ask this question because it's a very important question. Because a strong dollar right now would bring on that deflationary spiral that they so fear. So Ira, the, uh, you know, overall, here's how I look at everything. There is no, you know, solution to anything. So our, our job as investors and traders is to try and uncover all of the twists and turns as we travel down perdition's path. Well, well said. That's exactly right. And and you know what? And you see the opportunities unfolding. There, there are mega opportunities, just like we said there would be. And now that all this money with wind in its sails, so to speak, I'm talking about the global macro funds, they've got wind in their sail and they're they're out there looking. and. 
they, they'll take lessons from what happened in the gold and they'll take lessons from what happened in the oil and watch them start playing in a very aggressive fashion. You know, they've, they've been, they haven't really done well, so they've been more cautious. But the world I do know of my global macro uh, thinkers is when they do get wind in their sail, they get very aggressive. Well, I think that's a, that's a great insight. I think we should, uh, I'm going to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's, you know, I've got the scars on my back to understand that. That's a well-earned. Uh, so, like, I came in today, like, really long silver plays. I got, long, I got long yesterday, so Good. I took off, but I took, I kind of locked in some profit, and I'm thinking about what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I, again, I, I bought, I bought platinum this morning. I just got out of some, you know what? But it's been a nice move up this morning, and it's been such a laggard, of course, because it's, you know, the auto industry is on its, on its ass. But if, if, if platinum could start to make a move here, especially against palladium and gold, it would signal to me that the Asians are are truly involved in the precious metal market. Because again, platinum is much more an Asian precious metal play. Platinum is, uh, okay, palladium is one that's really thin supplied. That's why that was squeaky. Well, so is platinum, you know, but the palladium, and I'm not sure how it stays up here because, you know, it's not as much, a that has much more industrial base, than even platinum, you know, you, I, I don't see any really people wearing palladium jewelry unless I'm missing something. So they're they're using it in gas engine uh, catalytic yeah. converters and right. because of increasing pollution uh, controls, especially yeah. in Asia where the air is so bad that they're using a lot more of it. Yeah, but platinum is used for the you know in cat catalytic converters too. Yeah, they're, yeah. But uh, okay, that kind yeah, of and the platinum is really doing well against the yen too. It just had a cloud breakout. Yeah, you know what? And again, the yen is an interesting currency because, you know, it's held in here. Uh, they have that one big down day. And there's nothing that they're doing. Well, why do I want to buy yen? And I'm not buying the risk on, risk off the row, row that we saw in the, uh, at a certain point in, uh, in time back in the you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, when you could really trade the yen off of all oh, risk on, risk off. I, I just, I, I, there's too many other ways to put to play this, uh, but watch the dollar here, because this, this is this White House cannot be, in my opinion, more wrong and ill-timed. And in fact, you know what? I I'm going to tell you. I think I'm doing a uh, podcast next week with Lacey Hunt. So, uh, from the Hosington letter, who I have a lot of respect for, maybe I can. He's awesome. To Nice. Maybe. Dr. Hunt is awesome. Yeah, uh, maybe. Richard, Richard's in the room right now. Oh, is he? Richard, yeah. am I doing uh, Lacey Hunt? He said hi. Let's see what he says. You can unmute yourself, too, if you want to speak, Richard. Nah, I'll leave him muted. Okay. He's got, th <laughs> he's got thicker glasses than me anyways. So Ira, do you maintain any kind of uh, allocation uh, to stocks in the event that there's the unexpected outcome of much higher stock prices due to the printing presses? Yeah, I have I have money in stocks. I'm very I've got more in commodity based stocks. You know, so I'm I'm in the Russian fund. Uh, I'm going to get back into the Kansas because I'm still seeing Mexico. If you ask me what I think on a three four year horizon, supply lines returning to Mexico are going to be enormous. Mexico has a lot of work to do. That currency, you know, and again, Judd, run the yuan Mexican peso chart if you want to see it. And Mexican, you know, wages have been fairly uh, stable, but I'll, I'll do another uh, big blog on the uh, China, Mexico, because I, I think it's really going to bear fruit. Again, this one, this is an investment, though. This is not a trade. The pace of war. Uh, going, you know, just going back to the 70s for a minute. Um, yeah. And I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. What was real GDP positive or negative during that period? Oh, let me think about that. Uh, 
Well, while you're thinking, uh, uh, Richard said, uh, he says if we can a bit later as the, as, as the market might be too volatile, so maybe the week after. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. But Ira, here, here's why I'm posing or asking that question. Um, because if we get inflation, right? I mean, generally speaking, stocks don't like inflation, historically speaking, right? right. So, so if we had negative real GDP during that period of time, yeah. that would extend that would explain basically a 10-year bear market, right? Because stocks did nothing except go sideways and down. This go-round, um, if, if the, the expected outcome is inflation because of the debt problem, you know, what does that do to corporate profits? And do corporate profits, would they like it or would they not like it? Okay. You know, so, you know, this, this is the... Um, you know, one, one of the outcomes that I'm trying to think about. Okay, okay. so let, let me, and then, then I'm going, but let me throw this by you. So when you go back to the 70s, go back and see what interest rates were, okay? So yes, you had inflation going, and yes, you had negative real yields, but if you, but they'll be nothing like they are now. So if you can wipe out some of this debt that is, that is choking, or potentially choking and creating the deflation uh, scenario, if you can wipe that out with inflation, corporation balance sheets would improve. Of course, it's an illusion, but hey, you're wiping out debt. And that's what their object is, because that's what the object of inflation is, of course, is to, and you're bailing out debtors. And anyway, everything the central banks do, they tell you they're bailing out debtors. They don't care about savers. And they don't care about your savings, which they basically tell you, be quiet. And we're here for the whole economy, not just for a small select group of pensioners, you know, blah, blah, blah. So if the Fed stayed at zero interest rates with 6% inflation, you probably would, the stock market would probably do not bad to good because people would start looking for, you know, real assets to buy. How do I protect my money? Yeah. You know, if I own... Uh, Microsoft, I own a real asset. What am I holding on to cash for? It's not good. I'm, I'm, it's a losing proposition. You know, that's what uh, economists would call the Zimbabwe effect. Because Zimbabwe was, you know, under uh, hyperinflation. They had the best performing stock market in the world, which is some of what's going on with why people are pushing stocks right now, by the way. Where else are you going to go? Now, we may not like that as an answer, but that mon that monetary illusion effect is very is very important. And if you're wiping out debt on balance sheets, it may it may well in, in fact aid and abet the uh, uh, publicly held companies because they're real assets. Look at a utility. A utility is going to be earning money. They're going to be raising rates, right? Um, you, you would think, but it all depends on the politics of the regulators. Well, that's right. But, but if they've got that too, of course, they're going to pass on. Yeah, go ahead. Cause everybody's going to be under the guise here. If, if the, you know, when it used to be that you had, uh, unions that were strong, that could, you know, so if you had 6% inflation, you'd get an 8% pay increase, right? The next year or two years or three years. So you'd be wiping, okay, you know, I have an auto loan that I took out at 1%, and all of a sudden I've got an 8% pay raise. Yeah, I can pay that down. So that's what they're gonna want to, want to create the monetary illusion to lift the burden of debt. That's what inflation does. Quite inflation. Yeah. You know, when you said Mexico's got a lot of work to do, that's an understatement. In yesterday's Wall Street Journal of all places, you had an article and pictures of the drug cartels yeah. handing out food, yeah. g giving out food and supplies. Yeah. So, well, you know, you know? So, that show down there. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what AMLO is thinking. I really don't. Well, and again, you know what? If you're an anti-corruption, then, go, then go, as I say, go at it. And say to the, say to the, uh, the drug guys, 
okay, you want to be part of this society, you want to keep your wealth, keep your wealth. Whatever took place before, we're not going to prosecute, but your money's staying here and it's going to be invested in Mexican corporations. You're going to, and let's get on with it. Or if you're going to keep running this game, you know what? Then we're going to go to all out war. And when, I'm, when I finish with you, because if I'm a nation state, if, I, if I'm a sovereign nation state and I can't control this, then I can't call myself a sovereign anymore. Because what am I doing? You know, I go back to the theoretical basis, Thomas Hobbes and uh, uh, Rousseau and, uh, and Locke on social contract theory. Well, if I can't protect my citizenry, and that's the deal that we inherently make to be part of the commonweal, then I've being, then, then it's over. And if I can't, with my military force, secure the safety of this country, then you know what? It's over. So you, you have to challenge them to that. And, and you're, listen, it's going to be bloody. And it's going to, but you may as well do it to secure a better future. Otherwise, you just keep carrying on like this and you're choking yourself because Mexico could really be the balancer to China. I, I agree with that a thousand percent. I, I say that all the time is that they're, they're, they're blowing a huge, huge opportunity. Yeah, and Trump basically handed it to him on a silver platter. Yeah. And, and you even have Europe who's just made a trade deal with Mexico. So the Europeans understand it. The Germans understand it. You know what? I don't have to build my next auto plant in Spartanburg. I'll build it in, you know, I, right, right at the border. I can get those, you know, and it's, and you know what? You don't even have to sacrifice environmental concerns anymore. You don't even, you can do this because the, the currency is such a, a, a trade weighted advantage for them. And, you know, I talked to a guy who, I, and I've told you this, he, he built, he spent 25 years in China building factories for all kinds of corporations. He's been, up until the COVID, he was going down to Mexico because a lot of large corporations got the message and they were looking at building and reopening factories with Milky Dory and to, they know they needed supply lines. And your Judd, that KSU is KSU for a reason. Yeah. And this is the one that's been doing well and not really breaking. I mean, it had a it had a nice buying opportunity yesterday again at the 50 day. It yeah. still acts great. I know, but so much of it's tied to the pace, so it goes up and down, up and down. <laughs> here, here, here Bill, Bill's another guy that's got international companies everywhere, Ira. Yeah, right. And he says, I totally agree. We, we are moving a lot of our production out of China to Mexico. Yeah. It, I'm going to tell you what, do the math. The man is so simple. And, and we know the Mexican workforce is a great workforce because they all come here to work and we applaud what their ability is. So I'm, I'm low. I'm bringing those. I'm trying to create jobs here by the hundreds of thousands. And they want to work. They do want to work. You know what? They want to work. They're not sitting in a bar in Wisconsin wearing wife beaters drinking beer. You know, they come here. I'm hard, you know, being in Chicago as long as I have been and dealing with as many Mexicans on a day to day basis in the service, just absolutely phenomenally, you know, really great. So bring the jobs closer to home. And I, so when I hear Bill say that, I hear all types of anecdotal stuff, it, but it's that corruption issue and they really need to get it under control. And again, it's like the Godfather, you know, keep your, keep the money. I'm not, I won't go after you. It's almost like Putin with the oligarchs, you know, just do what I want you to do and, and we can all live better. And, and AMLO didn't create this. You know, we go back to uh, Salinas and uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Eduardo. I mean, the corruption has been so rampant. It's, you know, it, it's endemic, but you can break it. You can break it. And you have to break the violence of the drug cartels.
will go a long way. And if the military is that corrupt, well, you know what? Then you really have to ask yourself, what kind of sovereign am I? All right, thanks, Ira. Okay, all right. Uh, this one a lot far longer than I wanted. Uh, Richard, send me a note uh, if you're listening uh, about what that looks like, because I thought something was coming up uh, with uh, Dr. Hunt. So I, I look forward to it because I want to have a discussion with him about this dollar policy. I, I think this is critical, by the way. Yeah, Very and Eric just dropped a thing in here, too. It says the Korean government did that with the big organized crime families uh, in uh, Korea. And yeah. they created Samsung in 1952 and turned them into real companies. Yeah, you know, and it, it, he, you know, with the uh, Chabals, or I'm not sure how I pronounce it. I'm like, I, yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, they built those massive conglomerates. Well, go ahead; these guys can finance it. Listen, Carlos Slim, you know, he, he was a grabber who grabbed as much as he could to build, uh, you know, uh, the television, the telecoms. You know, he's one of the wealthiest men in the world. You can get this done, but. You got to sit everybody down and get everybody pulling. You know, you can't have a team of 10 horses and three are pulling one way and seven are pulling the other way. It's not helping you. No, you can't try and herd cats. You, you can't try and herd cats. And you know what? Just think about how tour, you know, tourism in Mexico is big anyway. But if you really rid the systemic violence, you know, violence is violence. Every big city has, but the systemic violence that emanates from the drug cartels, uh, Mexican tourism would, would flourish beyond that. So, yeah. I mean, you can't leave the zones. You can't drive a car. Right. You can't go to Acapulco or go out of the area in, in, in Puerto Vallarta and not get uh, in trouble. Right. Even, even guys I know that have family in Mexico, when they go visit their families, they don't go out. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. I understand it, you know, you, and, and that's, it's no way to be a sovereign because the so, if the, again, let's go back to Hobbes' theory, you know, the Leviathan. If you can't protect me, then what use do I have for you? You know, as Hobbes famously said, life is nasty, brutish, and short which then became the justification for surrendering your, some of your individual rights for fiscal protection. And that's what the sovereign is supposed to do. If you can't do that, you're out of business. All right, well, thanks, Ira. Really right. appreciate you coming in. Uh, everybody enjoyed it. Yeah, sorry we went longer, but- uh, That's all right. All right. Thanks, uh, I'm, I'm going to take your takeaway about these guys shooting for big macro swings. Oh, I'll also tell you one other thing that, that I, I think we should watch closely. And I, and, uh, I was having a conversation with Bookvar yesterday, and he told me that the Verizon CEO was on, or chairman was on yesterday. But I think the collectibles for, for uh, AT&T and Verizon are a very important indicator. Because uh, the last thing that anybody's going to give up is their cell phones. And the question was asked, actually asked by Andrew Ross Sorkin. Hmm, I wonder where, how he was able to come up. Asked him a question about, about delinquent accounts. And he said they were being very forgiving because they know how important the cell phone is. But those numbers become critical to the, to the uh, telecoms. So it's, I think that's a really good indicator as to how much stress is in the system. Well, Ira, uh, the states are all, already preventing utilities from turning off people's power. Right, of course, of course. It, you can't do anything else but that. But of course, they'll wind up with a huge uh, price increase to compensate when it's all said and done. Yeah, you know, which, which could be one of the reasons why utilities uh, are unexpectedly behaving so badly. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, he's telling Because it's not what you'd expect, you know? It's not what you'd expect in an in a economic slowdown. Nope. I mean, up, up until about, um, you know, early March, they were fine un, until volatility spiked, and then it was game over. Yeah. 
I mean, there was a lot, again, B, if people aren't tune, tuning into this room, if people aren't tuning in to listen to people who are really traders and understand, you know, listen to Druckenmiller, pay attention. There's so much opportunity from a trading perspective, but you have to be, you have to be on top of this. You, if you go ahead, go do it by yourself, you know, come in. Cause I, I, I read, you know, I'm a prolific reader and I absorb all, and I have the ability to absorb it because I've been doing it. You know, as Judd will tell you more than anybody, that my ability through what I called my matrix for years and plugging things in together is much more efficient than anybody can do by themselves. Just true. Oh, yeah. and, and again, everything I talk about, I have skin in the game. I'm not just- well, Ira, like John Taylor says, you know, from, you know John Taylor from, uh, from FX Concepts, you know, yeah. the currency yeah. hedge fund. You know, yeah. he's 72 years or 73 years old now, but he's like, you know, if you're going to play this game, you have to be bolted to the chair. Oh, yeah. That's when his I phrase. You've got to be bolted to the chair. Long, when he was long dollar yen and he was sitting next to me. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But that's, I, I know, but that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. No, no. This is, this is not a hobby. You've got to be on it. This is not a hobby. And step away. Listen, I've, I've had my least amount of positions because every day they give you so much opportunity. I'm not even upset. I don't have the silver coming in today. As, as bullish as I've been, and anybody who's listened to me, well, you know what? So I had platinum, and now and that was good. But where I would, be, and, and then trying to chase it, I'm not chasing it because they're they're just gonna show you all, everything you ever can imagine. You get another shot. Oh God, yes. You know, listen, I have orders in to buy gold much lower today. I'm exp I'm expecting to get filled on them, believe it or not. Oh, you're killing me. Sorry. You got your wish price? You got your wish price out there? Yeah, I do. <laughs> but I'm not letting you get ahead of it because I know you'll be able to prevent me from getting filled. Uh, All right. be like the algo. All but, right. And, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll find out those deliveries in silver. That's an important number. So if somebody else could go do that work and post it, I'd be very happy. All right. We'll look into it. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. All right, bye. Let me leave. All right, stop recording.